Okay. I tried to find the best lighting in my house. No, you look great. <laughs> cool. Okay. So welcome to the Sound Girls Living History conversation with mm -hmm. Stephanie Brown. Um, Stephanie, thank you so much for being here. And just to start us off really basic, how are you feeling today? And have you been working recently? Um, today I'm feeling, see, I told you yeah. she was, um, <laughs> I'm sitting in front of her blanket, that's why, um, uh, I'm feeling good today, uh, the weather is actually nice out here in California, so when you have nice weather, you have nice mood, yeah. um, and actually I have been working, I've been very lucky that, um, when this whole COVID thing happened, I've been able to work consistently. Um, I now work in a department called Ancillary Markets at Warner Brothers. And we actually do foreign language mixing for a lot of the Warner Brothers titles. And we also work on a lot of their home theater deliverables. So anytime a movie gets made for a theatrical release, we also then have to make masters as they're called for Blu-ray aka home theater which is now also dovetailed into streaming and so what that entails is taking the mix um from making it having to play in a theatrical setting to play in your home mm. in ideally a 5-1 surround situation at home because you, you always want to make the mix play you always want to prepare the mix to be able to play in the most optimum um setting and then because that and then you then just kind of cross your fingers that any other setting below that, if you will, it will play fine. And that's usually kind of like the stereo mix or the, if you're working in 7-1, then 5-1, and then stereo is usually probably how most people are going to hear it. And so, um, and then we also have to create other mixes for um, people who are blind. So um, there is a narration track that uh, goes on top of the film. So we go through and we QC the narration to make sure the narration is accurate in what is happening. And then we usually also kind of move it around to make sure the narration is not landing on key events in which you're gonna have to really manipulate the soundtrack in order for the narration to play. So it's usually like if there's an explosion or a car crash or something, you pull the narration either land a little before that impact or after and so I usually place it you know I literally to me it sounds like again someone's narrating a movie so depending what's happening do you want the narrator to set up the event that's about to take place or is the narrator reviewing an event that just took place mm -hmm. so depending on how they're um, describing the event you you kind of figure out where to to land it. Normally, um, when we get the material, it's already kind of in the place it needs to be, but sometimes you just have to shift it a little bit. So with that being said, uh, our department stayed fairly busy uh, last year, because even though uh, the theater shut down, Warner Brothers still had titles that they were preparing to go to streaming. Uh, so we worked on Scoob, which was the animated film and then we also had to work on Tenant and Wonder Woman because at the time there was still thought that those movies could land into the theaters so we still had to work on foreign language mixes for both those titles and as you can see I think Tenant of the two is the only one that really made it into the theater and then Wonder Woman did in a limited release I would say I guess um in December, but long story short, so that's the department I'm in. So we've stayed busy. And then we also work on rest audio restoration. So as Warner Brothers um, is trying to build their streaming catalog, they're looking to go back to their old Warner titles. And um, we take them and we go through and we clean up the, the audio, mainly the dialogue take out the pops, the ticks, the clicks, the hisses and make it sound cleaner. And depending on what they're asking us to do, we actually can take a 5-1 mix and we up mix, they say, into a home, Atmos home theater. 
or we are taking the actual 5-1 mix and just keeping it a 5-1, but we're again, we're cleaning up the audio. Uh, for example, we did a couple of Kubrick titles. We did Full Metal Jacket, Clockwork Orange, and um, yeah, those were the two. And those were not Atlas mixes, but we just uh, just went through and did a lot of cleaning up to make those um, mixes sound as you would want them to sound today. Just technically, we didn't really augment any of the um, soundtrack with any new sound effects or anything, but really cleaned it up and just made, not make it sound like it was from the 1970s. 79, I think was Clock Up Orange, 85-ish was maybe Full Metal Jacket. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but anyway, so like I said, being in that department has allowed me to work fairly consistently, not only through COVID, but over the past couple of years, I've been able to do that work. Um, and I fell into it and I'm able to take a lot of the skills I have as a dialogue editor, but mostly as a sound assistant and really use that skill set. And it's just really allowed me, like I said, to continue to work um, more consistently than I had if I just really focused on staying in features or working in television. That was amazing. You just took me they answer like four questions. Whole journey that I was not expecting. That was <laughs> so great. So many gems in it. So I have one question about sure. something you mentioned as yes. far as the, um, um, the foreign language version of film. Yes. So um, for, for one feature film, about yeah. how many other languages does that film get turned into? It depends on A, the title of the film. And I say title meaning the film itself. So if it's a tentpole film, then Warner Brothers, I can only speak for Warner Brothers, determines what, how successful that film's gonna be. And to some degree, they go to their relative territories. And when I say territory, sometimes that includes a country like France, or it may uh, include a collection of countries. Um, and they'll culturally, and they'll figure out how that movie may land. And depending on that title, then they'll determine how many of those movies they will translate into those native languages or common language. And then, um, or if they'll subtitle them. So for example, um, and we, and here at Warner Brothers, we don't do all the languages. We, cause each territory, if you will, will have a central hub in which they'll take care of whatever languages are, are relative to that particular territory. So we tend to do physically here at Warner Brothers, Latin American, Spanish, Brazilian, Portuguese. We always do Japanese. Um, and then depending on the, if it, the, the title's pretty big, we may do some of the Indian languages. Um, if it's even bigger, we may do some of the Asian languages like um, Thai, Vietnamese, Korean, uh, Ch um, China, Chinese, Mandarin, we don't mix from the raw units. They usually send us a dialogue stem, if you will. And then we complete, not necessarily the original mix, but if it's gonna go IMAX or Atmos, then we'll complete um, those various masters. But most of the time we're doing LAS, BPO. Those are the um, acronyms for Latin American, Spanish, Brazilian, Portuguese, and Japanese. And we don't physically edit the dialogue because obviously we're not native speakers. We the dialogue already gets sent to us edited in sync. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we usually do a QC, we play it down and kind of do a one-to-one -one where you hear English, you should hear whatever respective language, make sure nothing is missing. And then we send it to the dub stage and the dub stage mixes it as if they were mixing English. And uh, then we create, you know, that theatrical mix that then goes back and plays in the respective um, territory. That's so fascinating. Um, I don't think I've ever really heard a sound person talk about like dubbing in foreign mm -hmm. language versions of film. So that's very interesting. Thank you for yeah. that perspective. Um, yeah. So let's back up and talk about okay. the background a little bit. Um, nope. How did you get into sound and did you go to college at any point? Um, so my dad, I've always had music in my house because my dad was a DJ. So growing up, 
I never not was not exposed to music. Um, but the idea of working in the movies was not even a consideration for the longest time. So um, growing up, like I said, my dad was a DJ. There was always music happening. And as I got older, I migrated, not migrated, but my interest pivoted to getting into band. So when I got to junior high school, I played the clarinet and was involved in band. And then when I got to high school, I pivoted and went into marching band and which is the fall season. I, again, I, I was, um, wasn't was born in Texas, but I was raised in Texas. So high school football is big. <laughs> <laughs> so fall season, marching band was marching band with you know the football team. And then the spring season was orchestra or concert where you know we were um, working on pieces to then perform at a competition. And so throughout that time, my focus was either gonna be teaching or, or uh, medical, one of the two. But as I got older, I, as I was, I was leaning more to the medical, but then once I realized I had to be in school for seven years, I'm like, no, it's gonna be too hard. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> so no. Uh, so then it was kind of more toward the becoming a teacher and then um, in high school, I was taking a part of the curriculum in high school is you have to take private lessons with your respective instrument. So uh, being a clarinet player, you know, I had to have private lessons um, with my with a clarinet teacher. And I was still I, I was still trying. I figured, well, long story short, I was starting to develop an affinity for music, and I wasn't going to perform it because I'm not a performer but I was able to realize I forgot I what I was listening to I don't know if it was an article I read an article talking about uh about Whitney Houston and they were talking about her being in the recording studio and I was like well what is that and then as I looked into that I was like oh my gosh you can record music and my and I'm I take after my dad in which I'm very technically inclined so I kind of put two and two together and I was like, that's what I want to do. I want to record music, you know? And then the other thing is like, I want to be in the recording booth with musicians and kind of see them put all of this together. So that really started to develop probably um, when I was a freshman in high school. So then I was starting to think about what that path meant. And um, at the time, you know, this was mid nineties, not gonna totally age myself, but this is mid nineties. <laughs> and so um, just really looking in to see what that meant and the schools available at the time was USC, University of Miami, Berkeley School of Music. Those were the big three. And, um, and just kind of and looking into it, I was like, okay, well, this, this is the way to go. Uh, the one turnoff was those were all schools that offered a music degree in performance and not necessarily a degree in te the technical part. And I, I, I was an okay, perf I was okay mu musician, but I wasn't a performer, meaning I could read music, but beyond that, it, I just wasn't that inclined. And so through my private lesson teacher, she basically was like, well, why don't you go to a community college here in Houston? And she said, rather than, because obviously, you know, those three are all private schools with a lot of money. And my parents were like, well, I don't know how you're going to pay for those things, but, you know, scholarships are nice. <laughs> so, you, you know, I had to go and perform, you know, sure they get a scholarship and, Again, I'm not a performer. And then to perform in front of people was just compounding an issue. Long story short, I got provisional um, uh, scholarships to the three schools, but it was nothing that I felt competent about. And that's when my private lesson teacher said, well, why don't you just go to community college, get your, um, your basic classes out the way, so when you go to these schools, you can kind of dive straight into your degree. And that kind of made sense to me. And one of the community colleges in Houston actually had an audio engineering program. 
And so it was kind of like, well, let's test this out to see if this even is going to make any kind of sense for me to try to get involved in. And needless to say, I went there and I excelled in it. And it really kind of made sense to me, like, this is what I wanted to do. So while I was at the community college, not only was I um, dealing with or working on my um, basics or generals, I've, the term totally escapes me now, I was also getting a taste of what this meant to be as an audio engineer, was basically the um, field I was going into. And while I was there, um, I was probably, because I'm going to dovetail into a couple of your later questions. I was one of two women in the class. It was all guys. Didn't bother me because I was like, I'm just here to do what I need to do. I'm not gonna you know, worry about who here, who is or isn't here. I'm just gonna put my head down and start doing what I need to do. And um, I was pretty good at it. And so when the two years was done, I was talking to the teacher and I was like, well, how do I then now move on to a four-year college just because USC, University of Miami and Berkeley are just out of my league just financially. And um, at the time there was a school in Texas called Southwestern, Southwest Texas. They had somewhat of an audio engineering degree. And the main thing was these were music degrees. And I'm like, I don't understand. I don't want this to be a music degree. And in looking at the course curriculum for all three schools, I'm doing music theory, music composition, performance, and jazz. And I'm like, I'm not good at any of these things. And I don't know how that relates to being an audio engineer. So it was really, I was kind of hitting a crossroads. And the teacher there at the, uh, the community college said, a former, student, a former student of mine actually went to a college in Tennessee and called Middle Tennessee State University. And he goes, I think you should take a look at that program because that's actually a, a bachelor of science degree. And, and it was in uh, communications and it wasn't a music degree. And I was like, hmm. And Southwest Texas was a kind of along the same lines that they were having an audio engineering degree and, um, but it wasn't a music degree. And so, my mom and I got on a plane. Uh, no, I applied to middle to MTSU is how I'm going to refer to it. And I got in because I was also transferring in. So I had a lot of credits and stuff like that. And then flew to Tennessee. The college is 30 miles south of Nashville is where this college is. And went there and I said, and again, turned to my mom. I'm like, okay, this is what we're doing. <laughs> it's, you know, I like the campus more than anything. The curriculum makes sense. And this is where we're going to go. So I went to MTSU, uh, graduated in three years with a degree in audio engineering. And uh, uh, it's, um, I, have to, I have to remind myself, is it a Bachelor of Science? It might be. Anyway, I got a bachelor's in audio engineering. However, while I was there, you have to take elective classes. They had elective classes in post-production sound. Middle of Tennessee, little podunk town in Tennessee that I love, Murfreesboro. This college, which was a basically a glorified community college because on the weekend, everybody left. <laughs> because, you know, it, it, was, it was just a cheap, because Nashville had Vanderbilt, you had University of Tennessee. So MTSU was just one of these huge colleges in Tennessee. Um, it's a, uh, uh, not a, it's, not a private, but um, a state college. And it was cheap to get into. So that's where people from Georgia, Kentucky, um, Arkansas, they have like, there's some states that have bordering states that allow you to do in-state tuition. So there was a lot of kids who went to MTSU, but that lived two or three hours away. So on the weekend, they just would scatter. So it was ended up being me and a handful of out-of-state people just stuck on campus like, Okay, sure. <laughs> but long story short, they had these electives for post-production sound and I took one of them and I was like, this is it. This auto engineering thing with music, that can, that, because as I was starting to do more and more of it, I was 
I realized it was going to be really hard to do. Not that it was something I was going to shy away from, but I was like, this is going to be, I was going to, first of all, I was getting intimidated by just the fact of the matter. You know, it's not a traditional line of work, meaning when you graduate, you don't go apply and you work someplace. You have to network and you have to, you know, know people, not that that's any different than what I do now, but it was definitely, it was a lot of stuff was coming to a realization in which as much as I was going to love doing this, I, I was like, this is going to be a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. And so in the meantime, I took two elective classes in post-production for movies because my, I just love movies, love, love, love them. And I didn't even know the idea of post-production existed. So to take this um, elective class and go, oh my gosh, you can do what? I was like, this is where we're gonna go. And so I took those. And so that's kind of how I pivoted to now focusing my sights on post-production sound was through these two elective classes in a college in the middle of Tennessee. <laughs> Tennessee. <laughs> So then how did you get from, that's exactly my next question. Like, Liz, yeah. How did you get from Tennessee to California? So I, when I graduated Tennessee and went back home to Houston and I, first of all, L, the idea of going to LA or New York was absolutely not happening just because I, even though I had family in New York, New York is big and scary, right? Um, and LA everybody's getting carjacked at every corner. Why am I going to LA? You know, and there's earthquakes there. <laughs> so I was like, I'm not going to LA, you're crazy. So I went back to Houston and I actually, um, while I was going to school at MTSU, I had gotten an internship at a local TV station in Houston. So during the summer, I was working at a local TV station. And then when uh, classes started, I went back to um, MTSU. And it was not that in, it was a, um, it was paid, I believe. I think, I, have to, I don't quite remember, but so, but Houston kind of sort of had a post-production community. I'm like, well, you can do commercials. And so I was like, I'm going to stay home and see what I can happen at home. And at the time, Dallas was kind of having stuff happen. So I was just going to stay in Texas, put my head down and figure out what was going to happen. But in the meantime, one of my colleagues he too, uh, at MTSU, he packed up his car and he drove to California. He, he went on the internet and found as many post-production sound houses as he could, wrote them and called them. And he said he kind of just, and he kept knocking on doors and stuff like that. And there was one post house that he found that got, that he let him in for lack of a better term. And he started interning there. Uh, and we had kind of lost touch after college. And I, I want to say the advent, was it classmates? I'm trying to remember what um, in a website had kind of come around at the time. Cause obviously there was no Facebook. There was no, any of these kind of social networking type things. And I want to say there was a, there was a website called classmates and it was similar to, you know, you could literally, it was a, pre-social network in which, hey, if you went to this high school in this year, these are the people who are signing up to kind of try to connect virtually. And um, you could also do it through college. And I'm trying to think, I believe I reconnected with my college friend through that program. And we just started emailing each other to check in because we actually worked on a project at MTSU because part of one of the post classes, we had to break up in groups and our teacher gave us a three minute clip from a movie and the teacher said, you guys have to do the post sound to this clip. You're gonna have to do Foley. You're gonna have to dialogue an ADR. Um, you're gonna have to do uh, no music because there was no way the teacher could really get the music isolated um, or did he, I'm trying to remember how we had the music. And uh, he goes, you guys are gonna have to do sound design and, and effects cutting. And so he was in my group. And we really clicked and bonded and became friends. So long story short, I reached out to him and he said, Stephanie, if you wanna do what we went to school to do, you need to come out to Los Angeles. And I was like, mm. <laughs> okay. 
And law, and then he said, he goes, I'm actually interning at a company called Dane Tracks and reach out to them, tell them, you know, me and reach out to them and see what they say. Because, um, that was kind of the only way I was really going to go out there. Cause the, the other thing is I'm also very, very, very shy. It's hard to believe it, but it's true. So the idea to do like the fact that I would never have done what he did, which was to go knocking on doors and just basically cold calling. So he was like, contact this person at Dane Tracks. It's great here. And, it, and Dane Tracks was a small company at the time. And he was like, Let, tell them that you know me and see what they say. So I reached out to them and it was a, it was a husband and wife company. It's like I said, very small. And, his, and Dane Davis is the person who owned Dane Tracks. And his wife was running the, the company at the time. And she said, if you're half as good as Andy, we want you out here. We want you out here now. And, um, and so I turned to my parents and they said, I think the time has come. <laughs> and and uh, basically we had family who lived in LA. So we contacted family and said, can I live with you while I get this all worked out? And they said, yes. And January of 1999, me and my dad packed up my car into U-Haul and we drove from Houston, Texas to LA, Los Angeles, California. And um, my dad, bless his heart, when we pulled up to my cousin's house and we unloaded everything, he turned to me and he said, if this doesn't work out, you're going to call somebody else to move you back to Houston because I'm not making that drive again. <laughs> <laughs> and here we are almost 22 years later, you know, I'm still here. And so that's the way I made myself. Well, I went from Tennessee to Texas to um, Los Angeles. And uh, there you go. That is amazing. I <laughs> love that. That's such an inspiring story. <laughs> um, so, okay, this is an interesting question. Have you ever worked on set? And if you have, or if you have not, as someone who works in dialogue, mm -hmm. um, do you feel it's important to have some type of understanding of what's happening on set in terms of like the on set sound mixer? Um, I never worked on set. I went straight to post. The closest I got to working on set, if you will, is part of my curriculum at NTSU is I took a class called live production. And uh, we had to perform throughout the, the course of the semester, we had to produce three live events and um, nothing relating to post-production sound. One is we had to record a club performance. Another one, we had to record um, a musical performance, which ended up being like, um, uh, like an orchestra performing at the college. And the third one was we had to do a live talk show. So that was the closest. And, and, and each event, everyone had to change positions. So you couldn't just be the same position each time because part of the curriculum was exposing you to the inner workings of how to do basically live sound was the purpose of that um, uh, course. But I went straight to post, so I had no exposure to productions. It's only through people mentoring me and understanding the process that I understand what happened in production. And yes, it's important to understand, especially as a dialogue editor, what they're ha what's happening on production is because that's what you're getting. So however poor recording of dialogue it is on, on set, that's what I have to work with. And it could lead to either tons of ADR just because of how it was recorded. Um, it can lead to, and if they don't wanna do ADR, it's a lot of work on my end, just getting it to play as they say. Mm -hmm. And so they're, you know, on set, there's usually a boom and a mic, a boom and a lav, ideally. Depending on what's happening on set, that production mixer is at the mercy of everybody else. And so usually everybody else is getting time to set up but him. And he's the last one to kind of, and I say he, I should say she, 
they're the last to kind of get in there and really say, okay, I need the mic here. We need to do the boom here. If they're sitting around the table where we can hide the mics to capture, you know, whoever may be, you know, whatever may be happening. If they're, if everyone's sitting still um, nowadays, you know, when I started, we were dealing with stereo. Nowadays, we're dealing with multi-tracks. So we're dealing with every, the possibility of tons of people getting lav mics on them, as well as now trying to have a boom operator chase everybody down. Um, and so when we get the tracks in a certain condition, it's just to have some understanding what's happening on set gives you some understanding as to how you got there, you know, and, uh, you know, talking to some of my colleagues are having a really good production mixer nowadays is like finding the golden ticket in a Willy Wonka chocolate bar. Just because you're dealing with, also you're also dealing with environments, depending if they're shooting, you know, um, <clears throat> excuse me, not live, but if they're shooting in the city, you know, or they're shooting, they're not, if they're not shooting on, on a soundstage, then you're at the mercy of whatever environment they're shooting in. And the person who can really help your production mixer is the director. It's the costumer, especially maybe if you want to put mics and wigs and stuff like that, if, if there is an outfit in which having a lob is going to show. So that's the other thing is also trying to find places to put lobs that obviously won't show up while they're shooting. And so I hear, you know, the rumor is have the costume and hair and be friends with the costume and hair and makeup because, excuse me, they're the ones that you can talk to is like, okay, where can we put the mic that's not going to interrupt or that is also the best place for to capture the dialogue as well as not going to interfere visually with what's going on. But, and then the other time, the other thing is you're also dealing with just inexperienced production mixers. So um, some of the low budget shows I worked on, I tell people I have a cloth mic and a footstep mic because that's just how bad it was in which they were capturing the dialogue, you know? So it, you, I would say it probably helps to have experience on set just so you can be aware of what's happening, but I don't know if it's necessary to have that experience on set, especially when it comes to being a dialogue editor. But either way, you should have knowledge of what's happening on set so you can understand when the tracks get delivered to you, why they're in the condition that they're in. And then also too, when you're talking to a director or post supervisor or a picture editor saying, we need to loop these things, you can explain why. A, they're off mic, meaning there is no direct sound. So the person's not gonna sound as clear as I am talking to you. They're gonna sound like they're off in a tunnel someplace. That's why we're going to need the, to, to loop. Or the other thing is it's over-modulated, meaning the, the, your production mixer had the gain up too high. So anytime they spoke, they just blew out the mic. There's no way of fixing. Now, there's some tools now, but for the most part, it's distorted. We can't fix distortion other than looping. So it, it's also a way to educate, I believe, you know, in my opinion, the director and picture editor, or mostly the director, especially if they're young or new, the importance of getting good dialogue, allowing that opportunity allowing your production mixer that opportunity on the set to set it up because you know if not you're going to have so much work on the back end for post that it, it to some degree it can become a detriment to your picture so you know as much space as you're giving to lighting and costume and hair and makeup give that same respect to the to the as they say the other 50% part of the the other 50% of your film which is the sound you know, I, one of my really good friends years ago, she said, no one's going to silent movies anymore. <laughs> so, you know, anyway, so that's my two cents about production sound as it relates to dialogue editing, because that's the one thing that carries over from production is dialogue. Everything else get more than often gets replaced via sound effects and, and such. That was so great. I'm glad you said all of that because 
for a few reasons. I come from um, a live theater sound design background. Yes. And so now because of COVID, like theater has shifted to being a lot of like um, recorded radio plays and virtual yes. plays. And I mm-hmm. feel like that that's something that like theater companies are like grasp, grasping to learn is that th- this concept of um, garbage in, garbage out. As w- one of my teachers says, yes. I'm also a student at um, Yale. I'll be graduating in May, yes. hopefully. And like, um, if if what you record is terrible, like yes, post-production sound is a thing and you can fix certain things, but it's not realistic to expect someone to be able to fix everything that's wrong in right. post-production. So I'm so glad that you said that. That was amazing. Yeah, awesome. Yes, yes. That, that's that's kind of, you know, 101 in audio engineering. Garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> I mean, th- there's more call for language to it, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> That, that that is it. You but the thing is it's also it, it's still a struggle today trying to relate that same concept of picture to sound to directors going as much work as you're trying to put to get it to look good on tape, as they say, the same concept has to apply for sound. Yeah. You know, you need to get the best thing you can get when it comes to sound because you know, post-production shouldn't be a fix. You, sh- you know, that whole idea is like, we'll fix it in post oh, yeah. is, is, is a wrong approach because more often than not, all your money's gone by the time you get to post and post can end up being very expensive if you're not, if you don't get it right in production. Right. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, let me go to a different topic. Okay. Um, you kind of touched on this a little bit, but what is the difference between working in the dialogue department and working in the ADR department? Like what, what makes those two completely different, but also what are some tasks that those two departments share? Well, um, ADR, sorry, cat here. <laughs> ADR comes from dialogue. So the, di- so the dialogue department is, you're taking the production dialogue and you're cleaning it up is the general phrase. So what you're trying to do, I forgot who, cause I was thinking about this last night when I looked at your questions, I was trying to think of the answers to some of them. And I don't remember who told me this, but the concept of dialogue editing is to make it sound like it was all said in one take, in one shot, all at the same time. That's the idea of dialogue editing is to, to flow. You're to, because if you look at the track, you can see there's tons of edits because the picture editor has gone through and, and basically Frankenstein stuff together. You as an audience member is to never hear that. It, the, the dialogue should sound just as natural as you and I are talking right now. So the work of a dialogue editor is to not only make sure the words play, but also the background of those words, you know, room tone and hum is to go through and remove as many unnecessary things as possible. Because if you're shooting on set, there's stuff happening outside the camera that has no relation to what's happening in the dialogue. So the, the, your job is to remove as much of that as possible. And so when the characters are speaking, you can hear them clearly. You're not distracted by weird, it's called bumping. So if you're, you know, and you can hear like, Underneath your words, you may hear that's all the various backgrounds of the dialogue lines due to whatever may be happening on set when they've shot those because those particular scenes because they can easily shoot the same scene over three days. So over three days, the environment, as much as they try to control the environment, it can change. So as the picture editor has cut a scene together that you're that you're looking at, you're like, oh, they must have shot it all at the same time. They didn't, and it's my job as a dialogue ed- editor to make sure you did not, you don't know that. So what ADR does is for whatever reason, things may have occurred on the set of production. So there's two reasons for ADR, technical reasons and creative story point reasons. So the easiest way is technical reasons to do ADR. So let's say, I would say the easiest way is an action film. If you're driving in a car, practically, you're going to have road, na- road noise, you're going to have car engine, 
all that stuff needs to get taken out because yes, it doesn't make sense because you're going to sound effects, put it back in, but it's about controlling as much of the environments as possible. So there may be technical things, as I mentioned before, distortion. Perhaps when they were doing a scene, the production mixer wasn't aware that the character may yell or do whatever, so then that dialogue is distorted and unusable. Or um, there's also things known as bumps, so depending on where that log may be. If it's under a jacket, that jacket may be moving the whole time. So underneath, we're in, the thing is, you, you can also take dialogue and repurpose it. So there may be times in which we're using lines of dialogue that are being said, not by that character at that time. So they may be saying, you know, they could take a dialogue that they say later in the scene and pull it up. And it's all happening off screen, obviously, because of sync issues. So the other thing is, you're, if you're hearing a jacket move, but you're too, seeing two people on screen be still, then you're going to be like, well, what's that? Why, why am I hearing that? noise when when I'm not seeing anything on screen explaining why that noise exists. So, um, and again, if people are moving their hands, they may bump and thump, so you're gonna have bumps. The other thing is if people are eating, they're at a table, you're gonna get clanks because some actors, you know, are very methodical about what they're doing. So you can get clanks and clunks. So there's a technical reason why you would do ADR. And then the creative story point reason is Something may have happened in post-production in which this storyline is not working. So we're going to need to change what they're saying to better address whatever story point issues have come up in post-production that we need to fix. And so that will be the other part of ADR. So nowadays, dialogue and ADR tend to be the same person. For a while, they were two separate people, but they definitely worked together because the dialogue person technically can inform the ADR supervisor, I need, can we get these lines looped because of these technical reasons? And then the ADR supervisor may turn to the dialogue editor saying, by the way, these lines are going to change because there's creative story points we have to do, or we're gonna have these lines added in. And uh, an, another, not technique, but another part of dialogue editing, there's a thing called room tone. And the room tone is literally the space or the environment that the words live in as they were recorded on set. And so the one thing a dialogue editor then has to do with ADR is if any lines are getting removed, we still have to create this environment or air that the ADR is not gonna come sit in because the other task when it comes to mixing is for you not to know where those ADR lines are. It's to, the two are to come together and be just as invisible as the dialogue editing work. So that's how the two are separate, but in the end, come back and work together um, hand in hand. Hopefully I answered your question. Yes, that was great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, this is more like a pers my personal question that okay. I, I want to hear. I don't know if anyone else is going to care. Um, so okay. looking through like the list of films that you've worked on, my okay. personal number one favorite genre is definitely like scary movies and thrillers. Okay. So I'm just curious um, in, in terms of workflow and the overall work experience of being on different genres of film, like mm -hmm. Does any of that vary if you're working on a scary movie versus a drama or comedy? Or is, is every genre pretty much the same workflow, the same day to day and things like that? The workflow is the same regardless of the genre um, in which, you know, you have a dialogue department, a sound effects department, ADR. Music is not a part of our department. Music usually doesn't get introduced, obviously, until we get to the mix stage. But the approach is always the same. You have a spotting session with whoever creatively is involved. I learned very early on that's not always the director. So you always have to find out who is the creative driving force of the film. More often than not, it is the director. But depending on the nature of the film, I worked on a lot of Joel Silver movies. Joel Silver hired the director just to get the um, stuff on film and then the director went on vacation. So the picture editor now became the creative force in post. 
um, behind the film at Joel's discretion. Obviously him and Joel would work very closely together, but the director, but the picture editor was now the one driving the, um, the direction of the film. Ultimately, Joel had final say. So I learned very quickly, it's not always the director. Um, sometimes if you have a new director or um, an inexperienced director, the picture editor will step in and, as, and yes, the director will be there giving creative vision, but the, but the picture editor is there to kind of guide them and say, okay, if this, this is where, if this is what you want, these are the means of how to get there. So you have a spotting session with whoever creatively is going to be driving the project. And then that spotting session actually then determines not necessarily the work workflow, but the overall focus of that film. So um, if it's a scary movie, then the whole idea is like, how are we going to build these moments? What's going to be driving these scary moments? Is it going to be music? Is it going to be sound? Um, more often than not, depending on your sound supervisor, if they can, uh, you get in touch with your music editor or composer. However, the composer usually doesn't come on until later. But you, you always wanna have a conversation that if you can ahead of time with your music person to find out what moments are you covering? That we, when we cover, we're not competing on the dub stage, we can actually compliment. That especially is key in horror films because you know what's driving you know, those moments. Action films, it's kind of basically, you kind of put your blinders on with action films. You, pardon my language, you cut the heck out of it with sound effects. You go on to the dub stage and then you shape it. You figure out what, how, how these moments are gonna work. They're, as you've seen, action films are my favorite. I call it crap action. Um, I, I bow down to the Fast and Furious series. Um, I, they don't need to make sense. They just need, I just need to go and escape whatever's happening around me. And so as you can see, there are times with an action film the music's driving a scene, or there are times where the music goes away and that the, the sound effects are driving that. So the workflow is the same, but the genre can kind of dictate what that soundscape is gonna sound like. And, um, and then with walkie talkies, it's all about the dialogue, making sure that dialogue is clean, that dialogue is crisp. So, you know, more often than not with the genre, um, excuse me, with scary movies and action films, Dialogue is just to bridge you to the next whatever ridiculous thing is happening, <laughs> you know, versus a walkie talkie. The dialogue is important because that's the focus of the film. So as a dialogue and ADR editor, I, my work is now in the forefront. So that's about making sure all of that, as I was um, talking about earlier, is clean, it's rhythmic. You as an audience member cannot hear what is happening other than just listening to the words that are happening you know, on screen. So the workflow is the same. It's just which department may or may not be the focus of that genre in which you know, there's a lot of work on their plate to create whatever vision the director, just for the sake of our conversation, where I'm just gonna say the director is wanting for their film. And can you clarify the context that you're using a uh, walkie-talkie? Oh, me basically uh, a film in which every there's no they're not huge action set pieces. It's just um, it was a drama is a, a a drama romantic comedy. Um, so anything that is that's not driven, you don't like I said, it's not a huge action piece that's happening or or. Um, a horror film. I would, I'm trying to think of a movie recently that might fall into the cog. Walkie talkie is very shorthand. <laughs> I like uh, that phrase. It's funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but walkie talkie is meaning you, you're not cutting a car chase. You're not cutting a fight scene. You're not cutting, you know, uh, helicopters. You know, you're not having, you know, these things that are occurring which no one's talking. You know, it's usually, I would say probably a drama, let's say. A drama is a perfect example of a walkie-talkie in which you're, as a sound effects editor, I'm cutting BGs and hard effects. So I'm not having to worry about sound designing, that you know. Too. That makes uh, sense. That's so yeah. interesting, walkie-talkie. <laughs> I'm going to start saying that now. Yeah. Um, 
Mm -hmm. Okay, this is a great question that I feel like a lot of people would like to hear an answer to. So I see you have a lot of like um, assistant credits. Yes. Um, what do you like about working as as someone's assistant? What are good qualities of an assistant? And like, where, like. What is the value of working as someone's assistant? Because I feel like, especially young people, like mm -hmm. we're all striving to be like the leader on a team and nobody wants to assist. So can you talk? Oh my gosh. That? Okay. Pardon me as I step on the soapbox and, and get on my bullhorn. So um, the assistant sound editor, the best way to describe an assistant sound editor and the value of an assistant sound editor is think of a wagon wheel and the cog in the middle. That's your assistant sound editor. And then all the spindles that come off your assistant sound editor is your dialogue editor, your Foley, dub stage, picture department, um, ADR stage. They are the glue that keeps your sound team functioning because they are the ones that are interfacing with the picture department and getting all the material that your sound team is gonna work on. They are the one to technically make sure we are getting what we need from our picture department to our sound editors to make sure they can do the work that they're gonna do. They are also the ones that when we're gonna to go to an ADR stage, a Foley stage or a dub stage, they communicate to those facilities and say, what for, a, for ADR, Tell me what kind of picture file do you need? Tell me what kind of, um, what sound system do you have? So we can send the material to you in order for you to loop. Uh, if we're going to a dub stage, how many Pro Tool systems do you have on the stage? What are the capabilities of those Pro Tool systems? Then I can relay that back to my sound supervisor saying, okay, this dub stage we have you know, four Pro Tools systems. One of them has to be for the music editor. So technically we only have three. One of them will be dialogue. The other one could, the other two can be split between effects depending on how big that show may be. Um, and everything I, I call, you're a glorified traffic coordinator. And if you have a sound assistant that is not worth their salt, that will be one of the most difficult shows you can work on because to be a good sound assistant, you have to be able to communicate effectively. You have to be organized, organized, organized. The, the number one thing people underestimate when it comes, for me as an assistant editor, I had to understand what was coming before me and what's coming after me. Before me, meaning production, as to our question earlier. How is, especially as it relates to dialogue and dailies, because I'm the one that preps all the dialogue for my dialogue editor. So I have to understand how are those dailies recorded on set? How did the picture department prep um, the, um, the picture? Do I need to convert the dailies from one format to another? Do I, how are things named? So when I get the material from the picture department, there's a thing called dialogue assembly. So what that means is the picture editor has gone through and selected the lines of dialogue he wants to use in the cut. However, um, they all that that dialogue has been processed multiple times, meaning it's been converted over and over and over again from the production mixer to whatever place created the um, dailies that the picture editor is going to use to cut from into the avid and then back to you. Yes, it's digital, but it's been converted however many times. So the goal is to go straight from the source to my dialogue editor. So they, so I have to then take what it's called a turnover is the term from the picture department, take a look at the scene and takes, there's various programs we use to then have the, um, the program will then read, it's called an EDL. We'll go through and take a look at the scene, the take, the source time code, take a look at my dailies and line them up and create a Pro Tools session. There's a lot of trial and error with that happening just because you have no control what's happened on production. You have no control as to how the picture department has quote ingested the audio. So as a sound assistant, I have to go through and figure out how all these things link together. And once I've figured out 
all the boxes that has been checked, then I go and create a dialogue assembly. A lot of sound assistant work is supporting the dialogue department. Um, but beyond that, there's also a lot of coordination with everybody because your crew can be big. So I, you know, a lot of people are turning to you as the sound assistant going, well, when are we getting the next turnover? Are we having a temp? When are the changes coming? When are, you know, as much as the sound supervisor has all of this information, you are also supporting the, as much as you're supporting the sound supervisor, you're supporting everybody else. So you become not only the technical hub of your team, you become the person who disperses all that material to the team. You become the um, psychologist for your team. <laughs> you become the counselor for your team. Um, you become mama bear, you know, for your team. So uh, the, the marks of a, of a, and you have to work well under pressure because there may be times in which we're getting a turnover today and we're on the dub stage tomorrow. So you have to, you know, put your head down and make sure you go through all the steps you need to go through to get all that material processed. Um, but the key is organization and communication. You have to be able to understand what's happening and to communicate effectively. And to what I was saying before, understand what's coming before me. I mean, before me, it was coming after me, meaning how is this material going to be sent to the dub stage? How, and then when from the dub stage, what are we making that's going to then get released is the term. Are we, you know, are we making a DCP? Are we doing film? Are we home theater? You know, what is the end result? And so I can communicate to everybody. Again, all, a lot of this is through the direction of the sound supervisor, but um, the very first person, the person on the sound crew is going to call is the sound assistant. What's happening? What do you know? Is there a schedule change? You know? And so you become the glue that keeps all of this running because as editors, the editors are off in their own world, just having their head down and just working. You as a sound assistant, you're, you have your hands in everything and you're the one that's keeping the ship and the train on the tracks to keep moving forward at the direction and at the um, tutelage of your sound supervisor. Sometimes, you know, the strongest person on the team is your, your sound assistant because your sound, depending on your sound, your sound supervisor could be someone like Dane Davis, who's also cutting and sound designing. So they're also off in the world, they're busy doing their own thing. So sometimes I'm communicating with the sound assistant, I mean, the picture assistant, when are we getting changes? Oh, okay, which reels are changing? Oh, really? Okay. Oh, we're doing a rebalance. Oh, okay. Oh, there's a temp coming up. Okay, you know, so you kind of are the hub of all that information. And then there's some sound supervisors that truly supervise. Their job is they're not as evolved creatively as much as they're, you know, kind of making sure they've delegated the task and they're making sure everybody is on point trying to get to whatever those goalposts may be, whether it be a temp, pre-dubs, or eventually to a final. So um, any person who thinks, in my opinion, who feels they don't need to be an assistant in order to become an editor or a sound supervisor is sorely mistaken because you need to understand what's coming before you and what's coming after you. And I run into many of people who have leapt from an intern to a sound editor and they don't understand what's happening. They, they don't understand what's happening around them. And so it, 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 it is my opinion, foolish to dismiss the idea of being an assistant sound editor because you understand how everything comes together at that point. You're not in a room focusing on one thing or the other. And as I had moved, as I've moved from dialogue editor from assistant, I'm also very self-contained. I, I know how to take care of myself and sometimes take the burden off the sound assistant, you know, cause I'm like, I know you're busy doing something, other things. I can take care of this myself. I just need you to make sure X, Y, and Z are okay. But other than that, I am, I'm good as we like to say. So it is, in my opinion, so important to understand what the members on your team do, especially the assistant sound editor. So uh, that's also a way I think too, to get in as an assistant sound editor, because again, you get exposed to a lot of things and then, you know, you can then move on to whatever respective um, 
thing you want to do, whether it be sound design or, or what have you. But I, I think to it's a disservice to undervalue what an assistant sound editor can bring to the table. Hopefully I answered your question. Yes, that was great. I'm currently working as an apprentice sound person on a scripted show. And it's it's really interesting. I do work closely with the assistant. Um, right. And I don't, I, the person who hired me was the sound supervisor and I'm yeah. very close with him, but he was like, okay, once this, this show starts, you're not really going to be talking to me at all. You're going to be talking to, to the assistant. So yes. I really am learning that like this assistant is like so important on the sound team, which is crazy. So yeah, thank you for sharing mm -hmm. all of that. Um, okay. How long do you typically work on a, a feature film and what's, what has been like your longest contract and your shortest contract and what can kind of make contract lengths vary specifically for post-production sound? Um, well, it's all dictated by a schedule that's given to us from the post-production supervisor. So depending on what they've determined the release date is, we work backwards from there. Typically post, I think the math is about three months minimum to, to, to start. And it all predicated on, if you have a short schedule, you go, you give us a locked cut because we can't do the work we need to do as well as chase changes. So I would say the shortest schedule I was on was I did the movie Beats for Netflix about two years ago. That show started in January and we wrapped in March. And yes. And the longest show I was on, oh my gosh, that's a good question. I, these were two separate shows, but I would say there were one show when we did the Matrix sequels, we did them back to back. So I would say my longest gig was probably working on Matrix two and three, because as soon as two was done, post on three started. Um, and uh, beyond that, I'm trying to think anything longer, oh my gosh. Nothing is, um, um, movies are coming to mind, but I can't even think how long that they were, that they were, because typically you're on, as a, the other thing with a, an assistant sound editor, you're usually the first to get hired and the last to get fired, if you will, because you start the show with the sound supervisor and then you end the show with the sound supervisor. So you're usually on the longest with the sound supervisor. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I would say the matrix sequels were probably my longest. And then Beats recently was probably my shortest. And again, it's determined by the schedule by the post-production supervisor and when and how it's being released. So um, that, and that's, and depending on, and usually like you can have temps or screenings that can then interrupt that because depending on how those temps or screenings go, things can shut down because we're going to need reshoots or things and say, okay, the cut's good as it is. We're moving on to the, the final. So it, it's hard to really determine or to say on a blanket statement, you know, what determines a short or long schedule other than whoever creatively the post supervisor. And I can't even say post supervisor because they're the ones that um, the sound supervisor is working directly with in regards to budgets and schedules. But by the time it gets to us, they've already determined when they want to start and when they want to end. And if you have, if you're a sound supervisor that has a relationship with say the director, you can get started on sometimes during production. They may want sound design work done. The last thing you said, I heard you say was if the director has a relationship with the, with the post supervisor, sometimes sound. Oh, oh, I said, if the director has a relationship with the sound supervisor, they can get started early during production. And depending on the nature of the show, 
they may need sound design during production. So as the picture editor is kind of roughing these scenes together, they can get a sense of how things are going to play. But more often than not, you know, you're getting the sound is getting hired on once they've moved into post. So then at that point, that schedule's already been determined about how long it's going to be from when, you know, sound starts to when we need to deliver. And so again, those schedules are made before we get on and we're just at the mercy of those schedules as they've been determined by people above our pay grade. Right. <laughs> Interesting. So one one thing about the matrix, I'm so curious, what is how much of a like break did you have between finishing two and starting three? I'm trying to remember because I actually started, I was an intern on the first one. So I started January of 99 and Matrix came out in April of 99. So I came in at the end. Um, Matrix 2. So Matrix 2, I I can visualize the poster. It came out in May, was Matrix 2. And then Matrix 3, I think, came out that December. So we probably had a three-month break maybe in the summer. Oh, nice. Um, Because the movies were shot back to back. And they were basically cut at the same time. They were just released as two separate halves. Wow. Um, and so, so if it was, so if Matrix 2 was released in May, we started maybe January, eight, February. Then we were off uh, May, June, July, and then started back up in August for November release, maybe November, December release. Okay. Wow. But, yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's so fun though. Yeah. Like- I mean, and we knew, we, we knew it, it was no question that, you know, we were going to do them back to back and all this other stuff. So it was just, you know, I think it was just a three month break because, you know, the release of the second one, the visual effects still had to keep going you know, and stuff like that. So it was just a a break in the schedule to kind of allow a little bit of reset before they dived into three. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, Mm -hmm. So with that being said, what what is the hardest um, production that you've worked on? I, I was thinking about this last night. And so there were two, so... There's two productions I'm gonna talk about being difficult, but for two different reasons. So I'm not gonna name names, uh, just because I know this is gonna be public, but there was a show I worked on early in my career that was probably the hardest show I worked on due to the client. And the client basically, it was, we determined the client didn't like women and the crew we had was a co-supervisor was a woman. I, as an assistant sound editor, was a woman. They're actually both sound, because we had two sound assistants. Both of us were women. The dialogue editor was a woman. Um, and the, the person, there was a person involved with the client that made it clear that they did not like women so there was a lot of head clashing happening with my female co-supervisor and this person and the other thing with the client excuse me was there was a certain aspect of the film that they were very partial to so anytime we focused on this particular aspect of the film this person took it upon themselves to say well this is now my area of expertise So any persons relating to this particular aspect of the film, this person very much catered to and was very in awe of and very, and was very nice to everybody else. This person just was, I guess, annoyed by the fact that we had to be there. And it created this dynamic intention on the show that my dialogue editor was crying every day um, the tension was anytime you're on a dub stage, there are going to be reasons why you're not working. 
because either there might have been a technical issue or if you're working on a loud film, sometimes you just have to stop just to give your ears a break. Um, you may be discussing notes or you may, there may be a scene you're working on and you're like, you know what, maybe the direction we're going is not working, let's talk it out. The person, this client created such an issue during the project that, project that anytime we were not working, the person's like, I'm not paying for this. The, state, the dub stage is down. And so we were like, well, no, we're not down. We're doing, or sometimes we're changing reels. Maybe, you know, we're done with reel one and we have to go into reel two. And that takes time, right? To take everything down and then to put everything up. Well, I'm not paying for that. Okay, well, that's just the nature of. So the post-production supervisor was then put in a position in which anytime we had a reel break, it had to occur either time, either when we were breaking for lunch or we were gonna start on that the next day. So there was, a, there was a squeeze to kind of get work done in blocks of time. And, um, and then the other issue was just the, the way this person treated people. No one, it just created it, the morale on the show was pretty low. But what helped was we all realized it wasn't our work. <laughs> it's like, our work is not creating the problem. This is just the personality of this person, which then kind of allowed us to kind of all lean on each other and say, okay, we're not the problem this person is. And in the end, the project ended up being a wonderful project, something I'm very proud of. But 20 years plus later, I'm still talking about that experience on the show from the environment that client uh, created. And... Anytime I see this particular movie, I just remember all the problems that happened. So, so there's a lot of baggage still attached to watching this film. And then the other show is a personal thing in which I was asked to work on a movie in which, you know, a, a lot of people in sound feel they don't, they're not good enough, right? So whenever you get asked to work on a show, you're like, me, you chose me, okay. And then, you know, you're like, okay, you know, and you're, you're presenting, you're like, you know, that. I know this is okay, it probably could be better. You know, there's a lot of self-doubt built into work. And so I was um, asked to work on the show and the amount of pressure I had put on myself to work on the show made me an emotional wreck. Um, just because it was the first time I was working with this person, I was very in awe of this person and the work that they did. And the fact that I was working for them for the first time, I was very, um, not ex uh, exposed. It was, I was very intimidated and it taught me very much about whenever I'm put in that situation, I was taught a lot of humility in which I was like, I have to let go and let in. So I was, cause in, in working with this person, it was a teaching opportunity. It was an opportunity for me to learn to become a better editor. And my guard was up a little bit. And so there was like some kind of bumping up with this person about certain things. And then I was, and, and again, I was creating my own kind of drama and was just kind of, you know, eating my own tail and just kind of like really in my head and just, and then finally, you know, one of the things we bumped onto, I finally just had to, pardon my French, just let my shit go and say, you know what? just show me what you want, show me how to do this. And it just, and I just had to kind of stop presenting myself as an, I already know this versus I don't know anything. You're here to tell me, you're here to teach me. And the moment that shift took place, it became a very pleasant experience. It's so the person didn't know internally that all of this was going on. You know, I had to knot in my stomach every day. I came to work going, okay, what's gonna happen today? What's gonna happen today that, I'm gonna get fired. Most sound people think that anyway, what's gonna to happen today that I'm gonna get fired. <laughs> but I, it, I just had to have a moment in which you don't know anything. I call myself Brown. You don't know anything, Brown. You're here to learn. And I just had, and, I, and so everything was like, I was like, oh, show me how, okay, you, how do you want this? Show me, okay, great, I got it. Great, okay, that's great. Okay, next time I said, you want me to do this? Exactly, explain exactly, how, you know. And it was about just being open and so I've worked with this person a couple more times. And every time I work with this person, I'm like, oh my God, I'm gonna get fired today. 
<laughs> but I'm like, no, it's just about just, I just have to remember, just be open, be open. They hired you because they want you there. They're not hiring there to fire you. You know what I'm saying? So those were the two most difficult, and, and, and there's been difficult shows along the way for various reasons, but the, the show I was telling you about before um, was probably, like I said, 20 plus years later, I'm still talking about that experience on that show with that particular client. And, you know, years later and talking to other people, that client was just that client with everybody. It just wasn't our show in particular. That, that, that person was just that way to the point that they kind of worked their way through all of post that eventually no one wanted to work with them. But, but you know, so, and I was, I, you know, this is the beginning of my career. So I'm taking cues from everybody around me about how to really react to what's happening on this show. And the fact that every, these are professional people I looked up to that were just like, oh my gosh, how are we getting through this? You know, and to have my, you know, dialogue editor every day going, why do I feel worthless today? Because this person's making me feel like I don't know what I'm doing. You know, and like I said, we all bonded together going, no, we all know what we're doing. This person is just being this person, you know, so there you go. That was great. Thank you. On that, that struck a few uh, chords with me. So yeah. on the flip side of that, what's yeah. like the, your favorite film that you've worked on? Oh, my favorite film that I've worked on. Oh my gosh. Oh man. Um, that's a hard question because they're all my babies for various reasons, good or bad. Um, and I would have to say my favorite film. Okay. There. Okay. My, one of the films I worked on that I'm the most proud of, and you probably saw in my IMDb, I worked on a documentary called the bloods and crips, um, made in America. And I, I know I wasn't born and raised here in LA, so I'm not very familiar with the history of Los Angeles. And then outside of Los Angeles, you know, at the time, mid nineties and such, you know, the thing was there's gangs in LA and there's the bloods and the crips. And so, you know, as I mentioned earlier, one of the silly reasons not coming here is like, oh my God, LA is dangerous, you know? Um, and so um, I got an opportunity to sound supervise this documentary called Made in America, Bloods and the Crips. And that documentary was heartbreaking because it basically pulled back the curtain and, 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 even though it was a documentary about the Bloods and the Crips in South Central Los Angeles, it's actually a document, it's a documentary about any community in the United States that gets devastated by economic realities. Mm -hmm. And the breakdown of the families due to economic, you know, situations. And so to find out that South Central Los Angeles was a thriving middle-class black community and basically after World War II, um, if I remember my timeline correctly, basically, uh, yeah, after World War II and into the mid sixties, there was a shift in economics and South Central was very vibrant due to, there's a lot of manufacturing plants down there. And so a lot of uh, the African-American community had really good paying jobs down in South Central. And they interviewed the three, three guys who are thought to have started the gangs in South, in South Central. And the thing that broke my heart in one of the guys, he said, a gang started in South Central because my mom took me down to the local Boy Scouts and they wouldn't let me in because I was black. And he, there was a photo of him dressed up in his cowboy outfit because at the time you know in the 50s 40s or 50s westerns on tv were prevalent so he's dressed you know so he's showing photos of him with his little cowboy hat on and stuff like that and he said my mom walked me down to the local boy scouts because i wanted to join and the scout master said i won't have a problem with it but there may be other families who will and it happened to him and a couple of other kids. And he said, so we had no place to go. So we just hung out with each other. And he goes, and then he goes, we didn't call them gangs. We called them social clubs. 
you know, he goes, we'd hang out and, and he goes, and if we had conflict to what we did, we went into the alley, we beat each other up and then we were done, mm-hmm. you know? And, and he goes, and that was just kind of it. And that was the gist from all three of them. And then, you know, economic realities came in and the manufacturing plant started to close down. And so all these high paying jobs went away. And also, you know, that's also the time of a lot of, of, you know, racism, especially in the education system. And so they were saying, so when these manufacturing jobs went away, the idea of going back to college to reeducate yourself to find a different job was the, was the natural idea. And at the time, it, uh, space engineering, that's not technically the term, but Aaron, you know, a lot of engineering and space and stuff was happening the community colleges, those types of classes were not open to black people. It was very much, so what had, that what happened was a lot of black people at the time had to go back to jobs that at the time, we, you know, like we don't do these jobs, which is house cleaning, becoming a seamstress, you know, a lot of low wage jobs. And because they were denied the opportunity to go back to community colleges and get, uh, retraining, if you will. And then things just went down from there. And then just interview and um, the documentary, they actually interviewed a lot of current gang members and just, and then talking to the director, he, and I said, I'm like, how'd you get these guys to open up? He said, I had to pull them away for the group. He goes, I had to walk down the block and go around the corner and get them by themselves. And he goes, and that's when they opened up. Mm. And, it, and it's what you know, single parent homes, you know, my mom's working. One guy broke my heart. He goes, my mom didn't know how to tell me she loved me, but these guys did, you know? And so I think about, and in the end, you know, when I was done, I'm like, this is happening in towns all across the United States as economics, as these economic opportunities go away, then, you know, it just devastates these communities. And I'm not saying you know, all these towns have gangs, but you see the, the means in which people turn to survive. So working on that documentary uh, was probably one of my favorites for that reason. And I just keep going back to, I would say, even though I was an intern, working on The Matrix was probably my favorite because at the time we didn't know what that movie was gonna be, <laughs> but we knew something was gonna happen. And to see the phenomenon that movie became what was amazing, even though I was like on like the last three months of it. And then to be involved in the sequels, what is it's still kind of, excuse me, the highlight of my career is just being involved in that, that fan- franchise. But along the way, I've worked on so many movies in which uh, I saw on your list Da Vinci Code. That was a very interesting experience working on Da Vinci Code because we, we had security protection the whole time because there were threats about working on the movie. So we had, yes, because the, the subject matter of the movie was so, was such an affront to the Catholic community. We had protesters in front of Sony. Um, we had arms, we had armed guards on the dub stage. You had to have special um, badges to get in and out of the dub stage in and out of the edit rooms. Just because, yeah, it was, that was probably my trippiest experience was working on Da Vinci Code for that reason. And yeah, just because, you know, there were uh, Catholics like that movie's blasphemous. I can't even believe it's being put, you know. So yeah, so that was a very interesting experience working on Da Vinci Code. And and I've made, uh, and I've made, you know, I'm still good friends with all those guys guys get put guys in quotes although you know to this day and so yeah so that was yeah so that was an experience but um I you know I I've been lucky in which I most of the people I've worked with have been great people so every show I'm on I have some kind of positive experience just because the people have been great you know that's great so going back to you talking about the uh the documentary that you worked on yeah um i know like a lot of emerging filmmakers Mm -hmm. of my age group have this growing interest in directing and producing um documentary 
film. Mm -hmm. I think it's very interesting. Um, so what, what are some key differences of doing sound for a documentary versus sound for like a scripted feature? Um, the, cause I, the main thing was respecting what the documentary was trying to do and not to make it sound like a movie because the moment it sounds unrealistic, then you undermine the reality of what that documentary is supposed to be. So you kind of go with what the documentary is showing you. So for example, Made in America, the approach to that was when they were outside, we just kind of cut some Bee Gees and some traffic again to kind of complete the space because you know they, there are a lot of interviews were happening outside you know, or, or in a room. So it's just about cleaning that up, making sure nothing's dropping in and out. There were some transition pieces that were very stylized. So we did, of course, sound design for all these stylized, stylized pieces for the transitions to the various segments because that's what it called for. Um, I'll never forget the opening sequence to that movie, to that documentary, it was great. And it allowed for a sound design in which the camera starts out in space and then it zooms in to earth, into California, into Los Angeles. And so as you zoom in, you start to hear crowd and traffic get more, you know, more as the perspective pushes in. And then Forrest Whitaker was the narrator. And so his narration goes from Hollywood to Santa Monica to, you know, to Beverly Hills. And then we just a little bit of sound design as he hit each spot. And so you, you kind of, you, you walk that fine line depending on what's happening on screen for some of these transition pieces. Uh, when they were talking about, you know, um, working in the manufacturing and stuff, depending on the, on the visual, we may have sounds of manufacturing plants and stuff going on. Another documentary I did around the same time, it's called Bigger, Stronger, Faster, which is about steroid use. And um, same kind of approach, depending on what the visual was showing you, you kind of, you, you're there to supplement it and not necessarily override it. And um, so my approach was like, I'm, we're not making a movie. We're just here to, to present a voice and just to make it sound clean and complete and not go and not go overboard. And so that's to me is the difference between documentary and feature because you're dealing in documentary, you're dealing with real life versus feature. Obviously you're dealing with something that's make-believe. So you can, you kind of have no boundaries if you will. Um, but when it comes to documentaries, especially what the subject matter is, you have to be very respectful to what's in front of you. And my goal was like, I don't ever want people to think that they're watching a movie, which to me then undermines the message of what the documentary is trying to portray. Awesome. And then obviously the director of the documentary can tell you too, he may, they may say, oh, right here, I want it to sound blah, blah, blah. But the initial approach to me is like to be very respectful of the fact that this is a real, we're dealing with real life subject matter. Right, so. exactly. Awesome. Um, so how do you, well, actually no, let me ask this question first because you kind of touched on it already. Um, especially when, when you were talking about the matrix not knowing not knowing, but kind of knowing how big the Matrix yeah. is going to turn out to be. And I feel like you've worked on a lot of classics. I feel like in general, a lot of a lot of the Black sound people who do work in sound, because there's so, so few of us, mm -hmm. have worked on all of these, like, classic films. <laughs> and, like, how does that feel to know that you were part of that? And are there any films you worked on that you are like completely surprised that that like that the level of reception the movie received because you you didn't think at all it was going to turn out oh that wow way. that's a good question um a movie that was an unexpected surprise oh that holy moly i need to look at my i should I need to look at my mdb to see what may come to mind um because i've worked on oh yeah yeah uh 
I may have to think about that a little bit. Um, and uh, and the first part of your question was just how does it feel to know that you've worked on classic films? And I I guess the basis of that question is someone like me yeah. feels like you are very successful and I want to be where you are but looking at your own resume do yeah. you feel like you've worked on classic films and that you've done a good job over the past 20 years? you know I you, you don't know it's a classic until after the fact there, there's some movies you work on in which you're like something's happening here you know you can feel it and for me it's I I have been lucky that I was surrounded by the right people that as they move forward, they took me with them. And they were um, interested in some of these, you know, they were sound supervisors that were not getting the big titles, you know, and, and within the sound community, you know, there are certain companies and certain sound supervisors that are just rarefied air, you know, and, and anytime there's a movie, you're like, okay, well, of course, so-and-so is going to be working on that. Oh, so-and-so, you know. So I worked on, I worked with supervisors in which they had to hustle and really fight to get some of these titles. And it's just through relationships that they've had with some people from when they were starting that as those people moved along, they took them with them. Um, for example, you know, like Da Vinci Code. Da Vinci, I worked on Da Vinci Code just because I happened to be working at Sony at the time. And the sound crew for Da Vinci Code actually was based out of New York. However, they were posting the movie in LA. And so the head of the sound department called me into his office and said, Stephanie, I want you to be the sound assistant on Da Vinci Code because they're coming out to LA and they don't know how we work out here in LA. So I want you to come on as the second assistant and just guide them and just help them acclimate to working out here in LA and working out here in Sony. So that's how I ended up on Da Vinci. Right, right time, right? Right place, right time was, you know, Da Vinci Code. Um, Matrix, again, I was an intern on the show, not knowing what was happening other than when I started there, they're like, you know, Dane got Matrix because Dane worked on um, the Wachowski sisters first show Bound because he had a connection with the picture editor and this is their show, you know, and you could feel an electricity in the air about this thing. And then it was, you know, and then it became the, the thing that it was. And it was just, you know, it's about, I was just lucky that I've been working with people who find their way to these projects. And then these projects take on, you know, a life of their own. Like, for example, I also saw in your question, uh, your list, Eight Mile. And um, Eight Mile, I'm trying, I found to say Eight Mile was a hit, I believe. I, I want to say, I think it did pretty well. And we, and I'm trying to remember the sh we got, I forgot how um, Dane got that show, but we were, you know, we were working on Eight Mile and we were like, we don't know how this is going to go. I mean, how, like, it's like, how many people really like Eminem, you know? And the people like the director, the director was um, Curtis Hansen and Curtis Hansen directed probably one of my favorite movies of all time called LA Confidential. So it was, so I'm like, working with Curtis Hansen, you know, but it was such, in, in, in that movie was very, didn't get to meet Eminem. So that did not happen. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, to be involved in that and just kind of like seeing that movie get put together. And then to think he won an Academy Award for Lose Yourself, right? He wrote the, the theme song and, and the energy of that film was, was great. Watching it come together on screen and seeing him just kind of like, it's auto, the movie was autobiographical. So I, I felt I now had a connection or understood Eminem better than I had going into the film, you know? And what's funny is there's some, cat, there's some people who acted in, in Eight Mile that to this day, and I'm like, you're so-and-so from Eight Mile, what are you doing? You know, like the actor, Anthony Mackie, 
every time I see him, I'm like, you lost to a, you lost to Eminem. I understand what's, <laughs> what's happening. How are you, how are you Black Falcon? You lost in the battle, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, and, it, and it's just recently, I'm like going, you're Anthony Mackie, you've grown. But still, my, I'm like, I'm like, you lost to, to Rabbit on stage. I don't, you know, what do you, in? and um, there's a TV show called The Unicorn. And one of Eminem, the guy who plays one of Eminem's friends is one of the, is the lead black actor in The Unicorn. And look at him, I'm like, I was like, you're, you're Rabbit's, like friend I mean what is like what's you know so but so to be involved in in that and see how that kind of evolved and became you know the movie that it was and and very rarely at the time do you know how a movie is going to go because the other thing I kind of you know you get sometimes you get too deep into it and you're like yeah this is going to be great you know just because you've seen it a million times so whatever rubbed you wrong the first time you've kind of you know you're like okay no that's it's not that bad versus um you know most of the audience is going to see it for the first time and walk away and that you know their impression is you know their impression so um so a so a movie that i worked on that was oh my gosh i now i'm like my rolodex is just like you know just trying to like I, I may have to come back to that one. Like I said, I have to marinate on it. But, um, but you know, you don't, you, again, you don't know it's a classic at the time, really. Some of them you have, sometimes you know, but for the most part, you're just, you're on the ride, you're on the ride, you know, and you just hope that it, you know, in the end, you're like, we just hope it makes some money. <laughs> you know, at the end, you're like, eh, eh. yeah, so. Awesome, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Um, if you could have chosen any other like post-production sound job to do besides doing dialogue mo most of the time, what would you have chosen? And I know you said you come from a music background. Like, are there any films, yeah. are there any films you've worked on where you thought, oh, like, I wish I was part of the music team or, or I wish I was like the Foley artist on this. Like, is there any other oh. aspect of a post that really interests you? You know, there are times in which I'm very intimidated by sound design. And I get just as impressed by sound design as any other person because I feel I don't have the skill set to do it. Mm -hmm. So when I see, you know, something come to come on screen, okay, for example, I worked, uh, I had an opportunity to work on Transformers 2. I wish I was a sound designer on that movie. Mm. Because the, the sound, that sound team, um, Ethan and Eric are phenomenal. And I was just a sound assistant on that show. But to, I wish I, that was a show I wish I probably could have been the sound designer on that show. Just because the sound, because of what they did was absolutely amazing. Granted, and it's also Transformers. It's a show from my, you know, cartoon from my childhood that I'm like, yeah, you know, it's come to life on screen. But, but so I would say I wish I, you know, had the drive and not the, I just wish I to, to be a sound designer you know on some of these you know sci-fi type films to have that skill set but in the end I'm actually very happy that I'm an assistant sound editor you know yes I do cut dialogue but I love being an assistant I love it's so in my wheelhouse because it taps into my OCD of organization and, <laughs> and, and, you know, just kind of in, in control. But, um, but yeah, so I would say, and I worked on Transformers too, to wish to be a sound designer on that show, on that movie. That's would have, so interesting. Would have been really cool. Yeah. And even then shows like that, if you're a sound designer, you're assigned a small task part, as part of a bigger thing you know like you could be like okay you're in charge of all the gears you're in charge of all this you're just and it's only when it comes to the stage that it all comes together and becomes the singular element you know that you as the audience gets to hear but in the background 
five people probably worked on that one sound because of all the various, you know, the, the complexity of the elements involved. I'm so happy you said that. I remember about a year or two ago, um, I was in a program and we toured like um, a post facility that mostly does like like visual effects. Mm -hmm. And like the visual effects team explained to us that like usually one person does a very small visual effect detail on a character because mm -hmm. there's like like 10 other people working yeah. on the character design there's not like one person doing yeah. a major task so i'm so glad you said that that's good to yeah know. yeah you know for example like i, I i'm going to keep going back to the matrix because obviously it had such an imprint but you know in, in the matrix like for the squiddies you know there was someone who was just in charge of just doing all the tentacle parts right versus someone else who was in charge of the engine of them versus someone who's in charge of all the like lasers, you know? So everything gets broken down into its various parts. And then when it comes to the dub stage, then it all gets, you know, put put together. Like, you know, with car chases, it's like, okay, you're in charge of all the tire squeals or, you know, it, it, there's a way, there's, it, there's a way to kind of always break all these elements down in, in order to kind of, you know, the, the phrase is how do you eat an elephant, you know? bit by bit that this kind of like how you attack some of these you just you break it down to its most basic elements and then you and that and some sound supervisors function differently you know some will say you're in charge of this whole reel of whatever versus some are like okay throughout the whole movie you're in charge of this element you know it's a, it's a matter of how you want to view consistency so i love that thank you mm -hmm. and um mm -hmm. Are there any storytelling genres or formats that you haven't gotten to work on yet that you would like to in the next few years? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, because I've done action, I've done horror. I've, I, you know what? I don't think I've worked on a drama actually. That comes to mind. I think I've done, I've done animation. I've done live action animation. Um, well, I guess you can say Beats was probably a drama that I recently did. Um, uh, no, nothing really comes to, to mind. I, you know, I take that back. I really wish I want to work on a deep sci-fi movie, like, like Star Wars type sci-fi interesting like, like type thing that would i think would be cool that i have not worked on that would be fun to work on Is and that do cool? you have any interest in television or do you just love film that you don't want to do? I, you know i i it's not that i don't i have interest if someone approaches me with television work i like i've done television work like someone's approached me is like hey are you available to cut an episode of blah 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 um but i just think i I gravitate to features more because I think that's just more in my wheelhouse and that's just the people I know, <laughs> excuse me, are the people who work in features. And I just think the, the there's more, there's a different approach to features than television. Television for those who I know work in it, it's a grind. There's not a lot, you, you're just cranking it out because those schedules are just so short. And I, the idea of working that way consistently, I I couldn't do it long term. Mm. Versus, I think features allow a little more breathing room, you know, depending on the schedule and the subject matter to work on. And there's a little more flexibility, I think, working on features than television. Um, but I actually don't mind the work I'm doing now, which is working on, you know, foreign language and restoration and and stuff like that. I find endlessly fascinating uh just because it's just it's just an opportunity to um you know one of your questions i saw was i think about dialogue editing and i tell people dial i said if in order to be a dialogue editor you have to like puzzles mm. you have to like taking pieces and trying to put them together and trying to make them work and in the work I'm doing now, especially with some of the restoration and going back, it's like, it's a puzzle, you know, we're, we're taking a look at old elements and putting them back together and seeing how we can 
make them work and make them shine again. But um, so for the most part, I tend to leave lean heavily feature just because those are the people I know and that's just the work I tend to get. Awesome, awesome. And to close it out, mm. what are some of your hobbies and what are you looking forward to this year, especially after the chaos of 2020? <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, so what I'm looking forward to this year is probably an easier question to ask and answer. And that is James Bond. I've been waiting for <laughs> James Bond to come out since last year. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, waiting on James Bond to come out. I'm waiting to go back to the movie theater, you know, and and I'm waiting to see Fast and Furious. We even already got delayed again. Um, but that's what I'm waiting is going back and seeing that. And, you know, my hobbies are it's it grab I like I like sports so you know baseball's back so I'm interested in spring training um and uh you know I interested in, in travel I haven't had a chance to do it a lot lately but I like traveling I like the idea of going places and just kind of exploring and looking forward to getting back to that um you know my my hobbies Oh gosh, I used to have them, but they've kind of been, you know, not beaten away from me, but just kind of like by working so much, you know, when you have downtime, you're just trying to catch up <laughs> versus, you know, versus having, you know, a, a passion, you know, and, but, you know, I do enjoy, you know, like I, said, I just enjoy exploring, you know, and have, have an opportunity if you, you know, try to go to museums and, and, you know, I'm into um, exercising. And so I've been exercising, getting used to exercising at home and just really trying momentum, trying to keep that going, which has been hard with the schedule. And, you know, it's it's a variety, you know, it's just a variety of, of things. Any, 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 little, any little thing is just kind of like, oh, okay, yeah, well, we'll do that today. Um, but honestly, to be honest, I'm looking forward to, um, James Bond coming out. Me and a really good friend of mine, like he texted me, he was like, he goes, all right, it's October. I'm like, okay, I'm there with the hazmat suit on, however it needs to happen. We're going to go do it. <laughs> but, but I would, yeah, I, going to the movies in a the movie theater is such a special experience for me because that's what my dad and I did. That's he, he is the one that really ignited my passion for movies and ignited my passion for, as I like to say, crap action. Like I will, I can go see crap action all day long. And so when I go into a movie theater, I'm basically a kid again, regardless of what's happening on screen, but walking in, sitting into that seat, getting my, you know, um, jacket all laid out or whatever. And then when the lights go down, I'm ready. I'm ready for whatever, whatever world you're introducing me to, I'm here for the ride. And, and I'm really good at kind of divorcing what I do for a living and then watching what's happening on screen. You know, it's only when things go really sideways and I'm like, well, that sounded funny. <laughs> that, that, that was a bad edit. But for the most part, I can shut that off and just, you know, go, go for the ride. So that's what I'm looking forward this year. And, you know, it, because I don't work on a lot of features anymore. The other thing I love doing is going to the movie theater and watching an audience reaction to my movie. I was just going to ask you, do you watch your own films or does that scare you to watch your own? No, I, I just, I watch my own, I, I'm not opposed to watch my own films. What I love doing is if I'm working on a movie that is gonna be released in the theater, I always try to go to the theater and watch it with an audience to see what an audience thinks of it. Because I know what I think of it. I know what we all think of it because we've been thinking of it for four months. Right. But, for, uh, but to see fresh eyes and to see people see it for the first time I, is a big thrill for me. And, and, to, and 
And to that point, August, um, August of 2019 was the 20th anniversary of Matrix. And they re-released it in the theater. They had, um, did 4K, did um, 4K um, picture on it. Um, Dane went back and did an Atmos mix on it. And I, I was working on a different project at the time, so I get, didn't get a chance to be involved when they were doing the Atmos mix on Matrix. And so my boyfriend and I, we got tickets, went to the theater and it was, and I still get excited seeing everyone's reaction to that movie. And from the, from the very, from the moment the code starts to go down, I'm like, oh my God, it's happening, <laughs> you know? And everyone in the theater was locked in. And 20 years later, everyone was like, yeah, you know, and all the keys and I mean, and, and I can still like every scene, I'm like, oh, we spent three days on the dub stage on that. I remember we had a problem with guns on this. I remember like everything's flooding back to certain moments going, oh my God, they hated that cookie because the cookie sounded too hard. And, you know, like all these weird conversations that were happening on stage, but I still, the excitement was still there watching an audience. Granted that whole audience had seen the movie, but right. they were still the excitement and it still looked good 20 years later. Holy moly, it still looked great. So that for me, I, uh, you know, again, if I'm able to work on a film that's gonna get released in the theater, being in the theater with an audience, seeing it for the first time and the, getting their reactions, it's like, you know, it's like a, a proud mama bear. It's like, like a proud mom is like, oh, my child did good. I love that. That was so beautiful. <laughs> that was such a great way to end. Thank you so much. Let me stop this recording.